Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour, book of Genesis. Um, and uh, Genesis being a Greek word meaning creation, excuse me, and generation. And of course, the same being in the Hebrew, Bereshith, which is to say, in the beginning. And really, that's more correctly quoted by John, even in the New Testament. And of course, this word was from the beginning, as we discovered. And of course, God had created the heavens and the earth, period. Didn't say exactly when, but we know from the scripture it was millions of years ago. Because say, after Satan's rebellion, that first earth age became void and without form. And inasmuch as God now has uh, decided that it was the time for this earth age, the earth age of flesh man, he began um, taking that that was chaotic and void, brought to that condition by Satan himself from his uh, reaction and actions recorded in Ezekiel chapter 28 as the king of Tyre. So we pick up now with the creation. You're going to note that most every verse in the first chapter of Genesis begins with A and D, and it is a polysendintin, which is to say uh, it is a figure that doesn't say and God, it's and the creator, the marvelous, the almighty God. In other words, there's a lot more said than is written each time this and is used as the creator and the spirit. Uh, to cover, to hoover over, basically, the world, putting it into the condition that we have it today from that chaotic uh, situation. As God stipulated in that great book of Isaiah, hey, I didn't hide this from you, as we read in chapter 45, verse 19, uh, and continuing from 18, which said, I didn't create it void and without form. It became that way. And I didn't hide it from you. I didn't speak it from some dark place. So it's there for everybody to recognize and to enjoy, whereby there is not a conflict uh, with nature itself that is natural. By that I mean we are able at this time to document how old this earth is in certain aspects and certainly a Bible scholar has no reason to apologize we can do the same with the Word of God okay in understanding it so with that thought in mind a word of wisdom from our father we had covered uh, only verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1 Genesis let's pick it up with verse 3 and go with it and verse 3 of that chapter 1 reads and God said let there be light and there was light. Verse 4. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Now here, in a sense, think of the children of light and the children of darkness. Think of the prince of life, light, and the prince of darkness. And then understanding will begin to come to you concerning this. Verse 5. And um, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, stop and think for a moment. This is the end of the first day. We don't have any stars yet. And the moon and the sun won't be created until the, the third or the fourth day. And yet there was light there. And I think that um, though you're not going to have it, I'm going to turn there in the book of Revelation to, to help you understand this as we go to the new earth age coming, the third one. And let's read in the um, verse 23 of, the, of chapter 21 of the great book of Revelation, which is the eternity. We're already past the millennium. We're in our new bodies uh, our eternal bodies, and this is what the word says concerning uh, the city. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, 
and the lamb is the light thereof. And I think probably you can put that together for yourself. What? God was there. Uh, El Shammah in the Hebrew tongue. Uh, the last words in the great book of Ezekiel um, or even uh, Shekinah, which is to say in the Hebrew tongue, the glory of God is present, creating that light. And light always gives life. God is the life giver. So it was the Spirit of God that lightened the, the world and dispatched the darkness at that time. It was not the light we know of today as the sun and the moon. Now, sometimes you have to close your flesh eyes to open your spiritual eyes to understand and grasp what it is our Father wants you to know. So know that compared to his brightness, his glory, that he is, in fact, the only light we need. All other light is, um, is uh, provided by him for us and for the creatures of the world. So the light that is spoken of here is not what some would think but is the very presence of God. I can think of no other term to put it in. This also comes to that point that it can separate the children of light, day, from the children of darkness. It's important for you to note, you could almost, you, you know, you can teach Revelation from this book practically in much of the New Testament. Because Inasmuch as the children of the day are in the light and the children of the night being in the darkness, being the prince of darkness, Satan, so we see the set aside ones that are never, in other words, if you are in God, he is with you, so you never walk in darkness. You're, you're a child of light. It is for this reason that all prophecies given concerning God's children are given in days. That's solar, the solar calendar. And all prophecies given concerning Satan are given in months, which is to say moons are the night or darkness. And the moon calendar is quite, just frankly, it's, it's chaotic. It, it is a mess to keep up with the moons. The solar calendar is perfect because it never changes. The spring equinox happens the, uh, the same year in, year out. It is for that reason that Shepherd's Chapel goes by the solar calendar in determining Passover even. Okay, enough said. You get the point, God was with us, light was there, and the light was good. Why? It was our Father. Verse six, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. This is, let there be an expansion. Now, bear in mind, I want to draw on your memory a little bit. Back in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18, God created the earth out of the water, not in the water. But in that katabo, that overflow of Satan's rebellion, there was a flood that would make Noah's flood look like a a spring shower. And I know some will resent that, be that as it may. Yet all the destruction, and you can still see signs of it in this world even at this time. We now have the North Pole 90 degrees, um, really uh, 90 miles rather, it's set over from true north, which according to where you are on the globe, uh, all pilots have to correct their compasses because of that anywhere from say seven, uh, normally five to seven degrees. East is least and west is best. There's a little rhyme that you um, memorize to know which way to adjust the compass because of this earth being just a little bit off kilter. It happened instantly. We have found many proofs of this in um, remains, uh, an instant freeze, and um, the um, reasons that cause an instant freeze to come to pass and so forth. So we, we know that it happened, but here he's dividing the water back again, and he's not talking about the receding waters 
of Noah's flood. Verse 7. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. In other words, he caused the water to recede. He put part of the water back into the firmament, which means into the heavens or atmosphere. And, um, and so it was. It, if you use your mind just a moment, you might know where much of that water came from that brought that flood to pass. If there was actually water overhead that filtered. Verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven, that is to say, that that was above, that spance. Uh, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So, in a sense, he created Eretz, earth, um, and heaven on that second day for this earth age. Verse 9. Uh, let, me, let me rephrase that because that could mislead someone. He brought both the earth and the heaven into the day of this earth age. All right? Uh, the earth and heaven were both already here, heaven being naturally according to wherever God is. Uh, he didn't build another earth or create another earth. He simply caused the waters to recede and move upward into the atmosphere whereby land again could become in, um, an habitation. Verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the, under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Now, Noah's flood, it took several days, months, for the water to recede. Here, it was just bang. God spoke, and, and so it happened. Verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, terra firma, a rats in the Hebrew tongue, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. Not chaotic not uh, disturbed anymore as it was into a nothingness, tuhu vabuhu, and as we discussed in verse 2, but that it, it was coming back to that beauty that uh, we have. Wonder, wonder when the plates moved and so forth. You know, we found those animals of African likeness in Nebraska at Ashfall. I mean, it's absolute. There's no getting around it. Hip uh, rhinoceroses and camels and so, uh, and birds of Africa in that that died about 10 million years ago in Nebraska. So uh, interesting, interesting as we look at how God moved this and how He moved that. Verse 11. And God said. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. In other words, the seed to replenish itself was in itself after its kind, and that's the way God liked it. Verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass, an herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielded fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God likes things to stay as he created. The man always wants to manipulate. 13, and the evening and the morning were the third day. Now, Make note chronologically of these events and keep them in order in your mind. On the, the uh, first day, God's presence. Second day, grass, herbs, fruit trees. I'm sorry, the second day was the creating of the land itself and having, allowing the water to recede where there were no trees. And God created new grass seeds, trees, and so forth on that uh, third day, and it was good. 
14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, that's in the atmosphere, to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. In other words, we were supposed to utilize the sun and the moon and uh, as signs for seasons uh, with everything on its compass set with its rotation, whereby um, many might say, well, why do we, uh, that's kind of foolish to talk about seasons and signs. And no, it isn't. If you want to be a successful farmer, many times it pays, it, it pays you to pay attention. Um, example, if the moon, which is the reason that we have tide from the seas, oceans, if the moon can raise the water level five feet at a high tide, and sometimes much more, simply by a certain phase of the moon, think about it. Do you realize how many metric tons and acres are involved in that? It would be very difficult for man to understand the force that it would take to raise that water level to that elevation by the pull of the moon. Do you think that if it would not raise the water level in the ocean five feet, what do you think it does here on land to the surface water, the, the uh, subter uh, subterranean water, I should say, water below the surface? Naturally, it pulls that moisture closer to, the, closer to the surface. So, yeah, there's something to it. When you have powers like that that are at play by God's natural way, naturally it pays to pay attention. Verse 15. And let them, that's those lights, be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. 16, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And there we have that perfect zodiac, which really is God's Bible in the stars. You with companion Bibles, you have an appendix on that. Uh, interesting. God's overall plan is perfect. Well, why would he do that? For doubters. Those that would doubt that if he says a thing is a thing or a way, it always happens that way. I, I suppose the question is, is how well educated or certain that they can understand the works of God. 17. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And again, this was natural light from God in God's own way as well as the light of God's presence, 18, and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, 19, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So here we come to this fourth day and we see that we have the stars, the sun, the moon, the zodiac, and the other signs in the heavens. And uh, not, one is not to make a religion out of uh, that study, I, w I want to ha hasten to add. But it is good to know how it applies to God's Word, okay? So, uh, we have grass, we have herbs, the vegetation is uh, put in place in the earth. We have the moon, the stars, the sun, and we continue. I, I want you to chronologically keep these in order. 20. And God said, let the waters, I repeat, not the earth, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. Now this word nephesh in is soul. That's what you call soul. Bring from the water the moving living creature that has a soul and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. 
Now, I give you for supposition only, and I repeat, this is supposition only, something simply for you to think about. I'm not teaching this, it's for your own thought process. Uh, nefesh, the word soul, is translated 472 times as the soul of human beings. 282 times it, it, uh, it definitely is animal and 44 in, for different um, species, necessarily. It is ironic, knowing God's time that being not ignorant of it, that a thousand years is one day with God, that when we look at a people that would, a living thing, let us say, with a soul, that was created from the waters of the sea, which basically the sea pertains the same minerals that clay does. But the people who grow their wheat from the sea are in water. As a matter of fact, oriental history goes back much, much longer than, um, than the history even of the Hebrew. Um, this is well recorded, well documented, and again, that's strictly supposition. I'm not teaching that, but I feel it is something that um, as you look around the world and at history, that's man's story, that you stop and you think. I would not wish to debate the case, but at least be aware. Verse 21, and God created great whales, this follows, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So here, we have God creating the fish and the fowls. You have water birds, you have dry land birds. You have um, fish, uh, mammoths, uh, as well as, um, uh, as fish of scales, scavengers, and so forth, 22. And God blessed them. Did you hear that? And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. In other words, to bring back that we found that was taken away in the fourth chapter of uh, Jeremiah at the overthrow of Satan, a uh, new creation for this earth age, 23. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Now here we come up to this day and we got grass and we got fish and we got uh, birds and wildlife. We still don't have a man, okay? And what, that's, that's important that you note. Animals were created before man. That is to say, at least the animals of the wilderness. Verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so, 25. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And here we have the earthbound animals uh, aside from fish and uh, and uh, fowl, we have cattle, sheep, um, the, the bovine, the cow, and um, camels, uh, so on and so forth, uh, uh, possibly, right? The wildebeest, uh, and so forth, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. Now think about that, that's God speaking where does this hour come from? Who was there? His sons, of course. As, as it is written. His sons. Elohim in the Hebrew tongue means God and his children, his sons. Every soul uh, God created, it was with him. 
Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let us make him to look exactly like we are. That's when, why that when you see Jesus Christ born from above, not born again. That's an incorrect translation in the third chapter of John. That's why God could say through the mouth of Jesus Christ, if you have seen the Son, you have seen the Father. Why? They're made to look exactly alike. The same as you are made to look exactly as you look there, okay? And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. They're, they're going to be fishermen. And over the fowl of the air, hunters. And over the cattle, hunters. And over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. 27, so God created man in his own image. Note that the own is in italics, meaning the own was added, meaning the word Elohim means God and his children in each image. Uh, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, it's important for you to note in this record of the six-day creation that the male and female were created simultaneously at the same time. And the fact that they were created rather than formed is important. So there you have it. To look exactly as they were. And here we have this creation on the sixth day of both male and female 28, and God blessed them. Boy, did he. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, why this word replenish? Actually, if I give you a brand new basket, I mean, it's never had anything in it, and I tell you to replenish it with corn, you would say, but pastor, there's never been any corn in it. How could I replenish it? And you would be correct. Now, if it were a basket that had had corn in it before, then I could be correct in stating, replenish the supply of corn in this basket. So it is with the earth. As we read in Jeremiah 4 at the first rebellion, God removed or took from the earth every last man. They were gone. And again, remember his threat was, you better be careful, I did it once before. If you don't think I'll do it again, stand by. So he created these, the races on the sixth day and instructed them to replenish the earth, resupply it again. The difference, man would be in a flesh body this time rather than an angelic body. Verse uh, 29, if, if this gets a little fast for you, just place it on the shelf over there and hang on. You'll enjoy anyway, 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, underline it in your mind, every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. That's oranges, apples, plums, Though they're not specified, you haven't seen the word apple in the scripture. The word etz in the Hebrew tongue, meaning the fruit tree, you can partake of. No problem. 30. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, soul, um, nefesh, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. In other words, God gives them hunting, fishing, and rights as fruit gatherers, 
uh, wild berries, uh, this sort of thing. 31, the last verse of chapter 1. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. It is my contention, and I do teach it, that when God created the races on that sixth day, that he created both man and woman at the same time. And populated the earth with the various races. You know, it has not been that many generations back to that 6,000 year period when this took place. I'm talking about the sixth day. And people following the natural flow of things stay as they are. We make small environmental changes. That is to say, evolution in a sense, I'm not saying evolution in the sense of a change, but simply that these marvelous bodies that God created will adapt to temperatures and so on and so forth by the thickening or the thinning of the blood and so forth, the ingenuity that man has in survival. But God created the races, both male and female, at the same time. And what did he say? He looked on everything, and it wasn't that it was just good. He said, and God beheld, it was very good. So this is why that no one had ever better apologized for their race in front of this man. Because God created every race the way he wanted it. And it was not just good. It was very good. Now, I don't want you to miss the next lecture. Because we're going to get into an eighth day man. That's why it's important. And that's why it's important that you chronologically keep in mind that he first brought the stars, moon, then the grass, trees, uh, the fish, and so on and so forth. And then on the sixth day, brought man on the scene and woman simultaneously and uh, to replenish the earth. But we're going to find out in the next lecture, he realizes that he's got hunters and fishers, but he doesn't have a husbandman, which means a farmer. So he creates another man, Ha'adam, in the Hebrew tongue. It could only be picked up from the Hebrew manuscripts. There are, I know of no one else that teaches as I do from these manuscripts in this manner. That does not bother me. I have studied it long and I have studied it well. And there is no reason for racial tension. When one comes to the understanding that God loves all of his children he looks and it is very good. And God creating kind after kind. That they're special to him. So if to, to do what he created each of us to do. You know, we get this nonsense. Let's say that the, that the um, Africans came from um, Noah's son Ham because he uncovered his father's nakedness. There's nothing natural about that unless you understand what uncovering your father's nakedness means. In Leviticus 18.8 .8 and in Leviticus chapter 20 verse 11, you will find that that is to have intercourse with your mother or your father's wife. That's, that's what the term um, uncovering your father's nakedness means. That's why they had to get Noah drunk and they had to get Noah drunk first. And when Noah passed out, he seduced Noah's wife. That's why the curse fell on the offspring of that incestuous affair, Canaan. But they were both Adamic offspring from this Ha'adam, as we will find. And they were naturally ready complected so there is no way that 
Afro-Americans could have come from that incestuous affair. It's, it's an insult to say that they did and that a curse was placed upon them. It wasn't. It was Canaan. God never deals in something unnatural, such as changing a man's color. That, that is, is the way he created it. So, all races were created on the sixth day with the exception of Ha'adam, which we'll discuss in the next lecture. Don't miss it. It's not really complicated. God did not teach these things in darkness. When you let God's word flow on its own, then clarity comes to the mind of the hearer and the reader. How perfect is word. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?